Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining me. My name is Iris and I run the blog lifeofiris.com where we talk about cruises, crew life, and travel. Today we are going to be talking about World Cruises 2024 and specifically we're going to do a deep dive into Fred Olsen Cruise Line's 2024 World Cruise on their ship, the Borealis. Those of you that follow me much will know that I think that there's a cruise option for everyone, but not every cruise is for everyone. When it comes to world cruises, I think that's the same. I think that there's luckily a lot of different options in the world cruise market, but that not every cruise line or every voyage, itinerary is very important when it comes to world cruises, is going to be for everyone. So for those that are new to what world cruises are offered, I have an intro to world cruises 2024 video on this channel um, that does a brief overview of all the different cruises that are out there for world cruises. I've actually found a few more since that video was made. And if you would like more content on world cruises, longer voyages, um, some vlogs on my travels around the world, I am a crew member, so sometimes I post when I'm out uh, at work, uh, please make sure to like and subscribe. Okay, so today we're talking about Fred Olsen Cruise Line's 2024 World Cruise. For those that are unfamiliar, Fred Olsen is a relatively small, cruise line based out of the UK. Um, they do specialize in longer voyages though, um, as well as quite a few ones that are from the UK. So if you are looking for a UK world cruise, this is a great option for you. It's also a little bit shorter for world cruises coming in at 101 nights, whereas often you'll see world cruises that are more in the 130, 140, 50, all the way up to well over 200 days. In 2024, their world cruise is going to be on their ship, the Borealis. The Borealis, by modern cruise ship standards, is relatively small. It holds just over 1,300 passengers and is just over 62,000 gross registered tons, which is pretty small by today's standards. Um, the ship kind of gives you an idea of classic cruising feel. It has a nice wide promenade deck for strolling. There's lounge chairs out so you can sit and watch the ocean go by. It's very... Um, yeah, classic cruising, midnight strolls on the promenade, kind of that kind of vibe. Um, it does have all of the usual things you'll find on a cruise ship. It has a casino, it has pools, it has a spa, has specialty restaurants, a main dining room, buffet, all of those usual things that you'll find. Um, but it's just a bit of an older ship, has some nice classic lines, um, and has that nice big wide promenade deck that goes all the way around, which I'm a big fan of personally. This cruise is going to depart from Southampton on January 7th, 2024 for 101 nights. So that means it'll return to Southampton on April 17th. The starting price for this voyage is about 14,000 pounds, which based on today's conversion translates to a little over $17,000. Uh, this cruise fare does not include things like a drinks package, um, but when you go through that, you can actually add that on for $24.99 per day per person, so just over 30 bucks a day, and this ends up being over, just over 5,000 um, pounds for two people for the full journey. Uh, that's obviously, just like drink package on any cruise, that's something that you can weigh what the value is for you and for the people that you're traveling with. There is quite a bit included in the cruise fair. Um, they do have, as they say, cookery demonstrations, um, which I think would be pretty cool as well as shows, the main dining room, in-room dining um, is also included. There is a whole other list of things that are included in your main cruise fare as well. Fred Olsen is not considered a luxury line. Um, there is not included shore excursions, like we said, the drinks package is more, um, but it is going to be a solid mid to premium range cruise line for you. Okay, let's get into this itinerary. So to be honest, for me, when it comes to a world cruise, the itinerary is more where it's at. Um, you do want to make sure that you're picking the right cruise line for you because you're going to be on for so long. You're not on for just a week and then you leave. You're there for months at a time. So figuring out what the right combination of itinerary and cruise line is, super, super important. Um, but itinerary definitely needs to hold a place. This is a big voyage. For a lot of people, this is going to be the voyage of a lifetime. And so if you pick the right cruise line, but it doesn't go any of the places around the world you've always wanted to go to, it might not be the right cruise for you, or it might not be the right year to do that cruise. 
pretty much every cruise line is going to change the itineraries for their world cruises each year. So if you are, you know, really into one cruise line and the itinerary this particular year isn't your fave, then maybe wait till next year. Uh, you don't want to put off doing the big things in life that you really want to do because every day is a gift. But um, at the same time, being stuck on a ship for three months, going on an itinerary that you're not that into, if it's the trip of a lifetime, isn't going to be the right place for you either. So um, as we go through these videos, cruise line is important, but itinerary is also important. This particular itinerary is a full circumnavigation of the globe, meaning that you're going to start in one port and make your way all the way around the world and get back again. This isn't the case on all world cruises, but for this particular one, it is. Like most world cruises, this voyage is going from east to west. So it's starting in Southampton and then it's making its way across the Atlantic. So I like it when cruises do this. I like going from east to west because when you do time changes, you're going to be going back in time until you hit that international date line and then that's a whole mess. But it means that you get an extra hour of sleep on the nights that you change time zones most of the time. This is good for the passengers because they're nice and well rested. It's also good for the crew because aside from, you know, those guys working the dog shift in the engine room, my husband's an engineer on a cruise ship, so I have to say that part. Um, but so the ones that are downstairs in the engine room, the ones that are on the bridge, those ones that work the overnight shift, kind of challenging for them. They end up having to split it around. But for the rest of the crew, it's an extra hour of sleep and a happy crew means a happy cruise. So I like it when they go east to west because you get an extra hour of sleep on those time changes. It's good for almost everybody on board. On the scale of world cruises, this is a relatively quick one. It's 101 nights. I don't think that that necessarily means it's a bad thing. You have slightly less overnights than you might on a longer world cruise. An overnight is when the ship stays in port for the overnight. So you get a little bit more of a taste of what that place has to offer. Um, but this itinerary in itself is still a great itinerary. I don't think that you're missing out on that much. And it's a little easier to swallow three months away versus four months away. And if you're from somewhere cold and it's, you know, Northern Hemisphere winter, so like the UK, I'm from Vermont in the US. So uh, this could be a nice way to spend those winter months not just being frozen all the time. So this particular itinerary only has five overnights. Five is still pretty good. There's some world cruises that have less than that. Um, and the overnights are in pretty common overnight places, except two of them. So Charleston, South Carolina, you don't usually see that on a world cruise itinerary and you don't usually see that as an overnight. So that's kind of a fun little addition. There's also overnights in Auckland, New Zealand, Sydney, Australia, Dubai in the United Arab Emirates and Kassab in Oman, which I have never seen that as an overnight. So that's kind of cool. Lovely experience with Fred Olsen and you're gonna visit 20 countries along the way. Can you go wrong? In three months, you're gonna visit 20 different countries. That's more countries than some people see in an entire lifetime. Okay, so you're gonna start in Southampton, England, and you're going to cross the Atlantic, and then across the Atlantic, you're gonna stop in Bermuda, which I find to be a really fun way to start this world cruise. So most of the time when ships are crossing the Atlantic, there'll be a stop in you know, Portugal or the Azores or somewhere on the European side of things, very rarely do you see Bermuda. So love this as an extra little stop there. After that, there are a few stops in the southeast of the US. The first is gonna be that overnight in Charleston, South Carolina. You're going to have a couple of stops in Florida, which is nice, get a little taste of, of the Florida sunshine. And then you're gonna transit the Panama Canal. So a world cruise is really, a lot of cruises put together. So if you've ever dreamed of going through the Panama Canal, this is gonna check that off the list and this is a full transit through. So this is, you know, it's a world cruise, you're gonna to go to 20 countries, but you also get a Panama Canal transit along the way. After transiting the canal, you're gonna be stopping in Costa Rica and then a day in Acapulco, Mexico. So after the stops in Costa Rica and Mexico, you're going to start the Pacific Ocean transit. This comprises, this cruise comprises a lot of cruises into one. So you've got an Atlantic crossing, you've got a Panama Canal transit, now you're gonna head across the Pacific. Now, one thing that is nice about this voyage is you don't ever have that long of a stretch of days at sea. 
this is going to sound crazy to some people, but so you're going to have six sea days crossing from Acapulco, Mexico to Hawaii. Six sea days on the scale of circumnavigating the globe. When you have six in a row, that's not that bad. So if you're someone that is a little nervous about going all the way across oceans, this itinerary breaks it up pretty well for you. Okay, you're going to have three days in Hawaii on three different islands. One nice thing about cruising to Hawaii is you get to do a little bit of island hopping. You get end up just getting a taste of each of those islands, but if you ever wanted to go back to Hawaii, you kind of have an idea of which island kind of suits you because each one definitely has a different vibe, a different thing that they're known for. So you're going to be going to Oahu, so Honolulu, Maui, and then the big island as well, which is great if you want to go see a volcano. Okay, then you've got a few more sea days as you make your way south. You're going to cross the equator and head to the South Pacific region. You're going to have a few days in French Polynesia, including favorites like Tahiti and one of my personal favorites, Bora Bora. I got engaged in Bora Bora, so kind of love that one. Okay, after this, you're going to make your way across the international date line. Uh, that's always a little bit confusing. The cruise line's going to guide you through it. Most likely when you cross the international date line, you're also going to be going back. So you're going to end up going like forward a day, but then also back a couple hours. The cruise line will get you through it. Don't you fret. Next stops are in New Zealand, including an overnight in Auckland, and then a couple days of scenic cruising in the New Zealand fjords. Uh, New Zealand is just absolutely breathtaking. Uh, in terms of countries that are way on the other side of the world, I would personally think it's even worth the flight to get to New Zealand, which I don't say about a lot of places where I'd have to fly for 24 hours. So uh, New Zealand is super gorgeous. Following New Zealand comes Australia, starting with an overnight in Sydney. Sydney is a super fun city. There's a lot of incredibly picturesque things. And I must say sailing into Sydney is, it's like maybe one of the prettiest harbors in the world. It's absolutely stunning to sail in. I will say, I don't necessarily know that this is going to happen, but when I've been in Sydney, based on my experience on a ship that's about this exact size, it is small enough to go under the Harbour Bridge, and they usually save the docking location that's right next to the Opera House for the larger ships. And so most likely you're not going to be right in that downtown location, but there's usually a shuttle that's going to bring you closer to downtown. Sydney is also very easy to navigate. It's not a confusing city to walk around. Like, it's not like trying to get through Venice. Like... You can find your way from A to B pretty easily. There's water taxis, there's shuttles. Um, it's a fun city and a good one to have for an overnight. After this, there's a few more stops on the east coast of Australia. So you're going to be making your way from Sydney, which is down on the southeast coast of Australia. You're going to be heading north along that same coast. It's going to bring you to a few places, including Carnes, which is where you would go for snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef. So if you're looking forward to doing that, that's something that you could do in this stop. Following this, there's calls in Papua New Guinea as well as Komodo Island in Indonesia. Komodo Island is, of course, where you will find the Komodo dragons. I'm just kidding. They're pretty cool, though. It's definitely worth going, uh, going on a tour to see them. They're very big. It's very hot. It's cool. After a few days sailing, you're going to stop in Singapore. Singapore is a fun city, big city, lots of cool things to see there, um, as well as Thailand, and then you have a few stops in India as well. Now, something I like that Fred Olson has done is on their website, if you're reviewing this itinerary, it's going to note the ports that a visa is required for. So a good thing to know with visas, though, is even though they're saying visas required, I don't know which country they're necessarily assuming you're from. I'm assuming the UK. And so like my husband is British and we need visas in different places. So like when I went to China, I needed like a full on visa in my passport and he didn't need one at all. So the Fred Olson website, when you go through the itinerary, it's going to say visa is required. That's a great starting point. Um, it You're going to need visas at some place along this itinerary, along any world cruise itinerary, regardless of where you're from. Um, but they're giving you kind of a good idea of what to expect. Uh, so like for in an instance in India, most people will need a visa. Some of these can be done online. Some of them you have to send your passport in for. The cruise line should give you a pretty good idea of what you need before you head out. 
Um, but something to keep in mind as you're planning your world cruise. Okay, next up you have an overnight in Dubai, followed by an overnight in Kassab, Oman. So this is two overnights back to back, which is kind of a nice way to break up the itinerary a little bit, give you a taste of the Middle East. So you have finished the crossing oceans part of things, but there are parts where it still takes a little while. So this is going to be a stretch of five days at sea going from Oman and making your way up to Aqaba, Jordan. This is where you can go on your hunt for the Holy Grail. Hold on, I have one. Where is it? The Holy Grail. I got this in, um, in Petra. So Petra is the place that you can go when you're in Aqaba in Jordan. Aqaba in itself is a lovely town to spend the day in. Um, but that is the place where you're going to take an uh, excursion to go to Petra. Petra is several hours away from Aqaba. Um, definitely worth it. Thousand percent recommend going to it because it's incredible. But don't think that you're just going to get off the ship and, oh my gosh, here's the treasury at Petra and this is where Indiana Jones went. Doesn't work like that. On this itinerary, you get to transit the Panama Canal and now you get to go through the Suez Canal. Uh, the Suez Canal does take a couple days to get through. It's not as exciting as the Panama Canal, in my personal opinion, but the great thing is you get to experience both, so you can make that decision for yourself. Um, after this, you're going to stop in Haifa, Israel. So Haifa is where you can go to Nazareth. It is not that far away from Haifa. It's maybe like an hour. I had a relatively bad experience trying to use their public transportation because I hadn't gotten the right card to use in some places it, you can't you know buy a bus ticket when you get on the bus you have to have the particular card that goes with it when you get there Israel's one of those places so if you want to use public transportation to get to Nazareth definitely get the right card ahead of time okay um, as your voyage is nearing an end so at this point you're on the last stretch of your voyage there's gonna be a little bit of island hopping in the Mediterranean which I think is a fun way to bring this voyage to a close, you've seen some big historical places, you've seen some incredibly big cities, and now it's just a taste of, you know, island vibes, a little relaxing, a little bit of, you know, hanging out on the beach. So you're gonna have stops in Cyprus, Rhodes in Greece, and Valletta. Valletta is another place that the sail in and sail out, oh, spectacular, just gorgeous, um, as well as with Spain, and then a couple of sea days and you're back in Southampton. So. Um, all in all, I think this is a great world cruise. You get to see a lot of incredible cities around the world. You get to go through the Panama Canal. You get to go through the Suez Canal. You get to do a few more, you know, ancient history adventures to um, places like Petra. And you can go to Nazareth. You get to see some Komodo dragons. So it's giving you a really good taste of the world. The world is a big, wonderful, beautiful place. This is a great way to see 20 different countries in just a few months, give you a taste of what's out there, let you experience it. And one thing that I love about cruising is that you can go to places that kind of take you out of your comfort zone. And then at the end of the day, you still get to go back to your ship and you have your room stewards and you have you know, kind of your comfortable bubble. So it's letting you experience the world, get out of your bubble, and then but still have that comfort to come back to, um, which I love. Um, it's, I, I think it's a nice way for people to get out of their comfort zone in a way that's a little bit more accessible. This is the Fred Olsen 2024 World Cruise on their ship, the Borealis. It's 101 nights long. Um, it's one of the less expensive world cruises coming in at just around 17000 dollars per person. If you want to know more about World Cruises, please like and subscribe. Check out um, the video description in this for links to a couple more videos as well as some blog posts that I have about World Cruises. Thank you and happy cruising!